two or three out of ten patients. When she came into the clinic, she couldn't read the big A. Even under uh, anti-angiogenic Lucentis therapy, at best she'd get a three-line improvement. Following the translocation surgery, she's been down at uh, 612, and she's been there now for nearly six years. And to my amazement, she actually got a driving license back in January 2008, and she's blind in one eye. We were only allowed to do it in the second eye. So if you ever see Avery uh, driving a car around London, stay on the pavement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, preoperatively, massive scarring, uh, RP dies. Postoperatively, we can actually use two methods. We can do the translocation, or we can actually take some RP peripheral to the macula and then place it under the macula. And the problem is both those operations are time consuming, although the translocation is nice approved. It's too long, can't really be envisaged as a standard clinical procedure, they are quite complex. So can we make this a simpler procedure? Can we make it an outpatient procedure? And can we do it by not using the patient's own cells? And that's where stem cells came into this arena. So we looked at various sources of stem cells. We looked at adult stem cells. We looked at uh, uh, immortalizing RPE. And actually what we came across, which was by far the best, was by using human embryonic stem cells. So human embryonic stem cells are produced from the five day of blastocyst, and it's the inner cell mass, which is the formation of the raw material of a human embryonic stem cell. It's from the inner cell mass that every single cell in our body develops from. The only, the only um, thing that the uh, inner cell mass doesn't produce is the inner uh, cell. So, we knew an awful lot about the biology of RPE, the development of RPE. On the left here is what uh, is, was taken from a biopsy from a 17 year old lad. On the right is what we can produce from human embryonic stem cells. So we're not putting human embryonic stem cells or we don't want to put stem cells back into the eye. We want to turn them into the eye cell we want, which is that middle layer, the RPE, and then so we're able in a dish to turn the human embryonic stem cell into retinal pigment epithelium. If we look at the protein expression, the function, the molecular expression, we cannot tell the difference between the human embryonic derived RPE on the right as compared to uh, primary RPE on the left. However, if that wasn't a big enough problem, and one of the reasons we actually came to Alex was in the aged eye, the membrane you normally sit on isn't conducive to you just squirting these things in. They have to be in that carpet. They're polarized, they're, uh, they have to be pointing in the right direction facing the photoreceptor. And that membrane in the aged eye is just not conducive to this type of, uh, to putting them back. It's no longer sticky. So we had to manufacture a membrane. And this is what we managed to do. So these are the human embryonic derived RPE here, and this is the polar membrane which we've managed to manufacture to a level which surgically we can manipulate and grow these cells in literally that carpet. We've placed those cells into animal models of retinal disease that stops animals from going blind up to about two years. However, the operation in those animal models is done in rats. That's not the way we would want to do it, obviously, in the clinic. So we had to set up a home ophthalmology surgical procedure at Northwick Park and look at large patients. And our large patient is the pig, because the pig eye is about the same size as the human eye. So this is the operation we envisage and hope to do in the first quarter of 2011 in a small phase one, phase uh, two clinical trial. So, you're just taking the vitreous, which is the fluid at the back of the eye, out because you want to detach the retina from that middle layer. You then pull fluid between the top layer, the normal retina, and the middle layer to make it black. Let's see that for a second. So this is the normal retina now being detached from the back of the eye. And that's the patch of cells now being placed between the neural retina and the back. 
That operation took 40 minutes, so it would be considered an outpatient procedure. In fact, 70% of patients and mortals would have that operation done around. If it was me, I'd be knocked out. So in CAR2, this is what's happening. It's a three-part part of play map. It just means, A, you're putting an infusion in to keep the eyeball deflated. You're using uh, a lower incision to put the light source in, and you use this middle incision where you surgical two lids. So you actually cause a blade, which detaches the neural retina. You make an incision in the neural retina, and you place the patch in, and then push it down. Because it's such a small detachment, it's not like lifting the whole retina, you only have to use gas, gas and air. So you don't have to go back to remove heavy oil. So it's a one-off operation. So if we put RPE back on these patches, do we stop those receptors from dying? Here is our patch, and here is the pigmented RPE, those black cells on it, and here's a full complement of those receptors. Here's the patch, no RPE, and this is the inner nuclear layer. This is not photoreceptors. There's no photoreceptors in the time. This corresponds to this layer. So by putting patches of RPE back in this method, we can stop those photoreceptors from dying. So we've gone through that horrendous um, regulatory path, and we've met with the NHRA. And as long as the final uh, preclinical studies go, as planned, we want to go into a phase one or phase two uh, clinical trial in the first quarter of 2011 using human embryonic stem cells as the raw material to produce RPE on these patches, which will then be implanted in acute retinal tear. So, this is where literally the RPE rips off the back of um, Brooks' membrane. So, the week before that happened, the patient had perfect vision. Week after that, vision is collapsing, there's absolutely nothing can be done. And then in the second case, we want to use failed Lucentis. So in cases where wet AMD, Lucentis hasn't worked. And the reason we want to choose these two <coughs> cases is it's failing vision with no way back. If we were to go into the larger group of AMD, which is the dry case, we would have to go into very late cases. They would already be blind. And literally just have peripheral vision. We do don't think that's appropriate. If we go into these cases first of all, we would mean we'd be able to do a second trial in dry AMD before those patients lose their vision. So this is uh, the rationale here. A question for yourselves though, which is you know, the ethics behind using human embryonic stem cells. There's about five half a million severe cases of AMD which would be appropriate for this surgery. UK. In total, there's about 14 million within Europe and an equivalent number within the US. My question to you is how many of these blastocysts do you think we need to service a population of nearly 30 million worldwide? Well? Do we need one per patient? Do we need 10 per patient? I'll leave that question for yourself. And then finally, just say thank you to a whole heap of people. Uh, a massive gang at the Institute of Ophthalmology, the clinical lead on this project, uh, which is Lyndon de Cruz, has been phenomenal throughout the project, uh, Karen Cheatham at UCL, and also uh, actually Santa Barbara, is, we've all, all started doing some of this work using induced blue over stem cells, and that's why Santa Barbara can, and also Pfizer, who are now partnering this 